all our rights away. No health care, corporate bailouts, poisoning our food, killing our children. What we gonna do? What's going on? Why are people dying so young? Tell me now. Can you tell me why? Why are people dropping like flies? Tell me now.
spot right here on the uh, YouTube live stream and uh, of course we have a great guest today we're very excited about Ken Navarro is here with us today on the show so help yeah. me welcome welcome Ken yeah. <laughs> this is fun and it's a pleasure to, to see you all and, and especially Joe who we communicated via email but I don't know if I've never seen his face or I know all the time they same here man <laughs> <laughs> You see, you might see my face, but it's always always <laughs> perfectly on some album cover, not actually looking like uh, not as good. Uh, the guy yeah. who did all the photographs for the new album uh, is out of um, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, named Therese Dean. And I told him, I said, I don't know how you do it. You keep making me look better than I look. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I kind of noticed there there was that touch up there going on, but you know, we'll keep that between us. Thank man. you. Well, mostly I just keep my head down. That's that's my <laughs> Nice to have you, kid. Nice Thank to you. finally Thank put, you. A, yes, put a face is. to the name. Same here, yeah. my brother. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the show, man. We're very excited about having you. And, uh, yeah, your music is very, oh, man, it's awesome, man. Very nice. Uh, really enjoy, enjoy all the tracks that you sent. And, of course, we're going to let our listeners check out some of that, but we want to talk with you of course first so um 
Yeah, yeah Ken. So, yeah, in fact, uh, tell us about the project, uh, the new project, sir. Well, this, this is my 25th album, um, and I really was determined to make it a special one. Uh, every album, you you know, and any artist will tell you this, they just go to the wall. You know, it, mm. people don't, I always say people would never steal music if they knew what went into it. They just would feel too guilty. Yeah. <laughs> but this album, I just really wanted it to culminate and bring all the things that over the years um, I've, I, I do, you know, and put my whole, what I call my whole vocabulary onto that, onto this album. The previous album was a very unique record for me. I recorded an album of my music with a, a full uh, symphony orchestra, yeah. which is a massive effort. Yep. And, <laughs> um, but um, so part of what this album reflects is some of the new things that I learned how to do and the new sounds that I had in my head and finding ways to bring those into contemporary jazz mm -hmm. so that, um, well, for example, on the first single, uh, When We Dance, yes. um, yeah. there I, I had the whole thing written and I knew I was gonna bring in Gary and Greg Granger, mm -hmm. who are um, a fa fabulous rhythm section that live here in Baltimore. They work with Acoustic Alchemy and Gary's played with everybody and they're, they're just wonderful players. I knew they were gonna play on it, but I heard something else. And what it was, was a string quartet. And I started writing this part for string quartet, which to my knowledge, nobody in smooth jazz has ever done that before. And I found a way to incorporate it. So it's like a hook, you know, it's not this unwelcome foreign thing. It's something that's really integrated into the song. And so that's the kind of thing that happened on this record. So there's there's really a lot of different things going on on the album, uh, a lot of different styles, uh, obviously contemporary and smooth jazz as well represented, mm -hmm. but there's other kinds of things. There's a real uh, driving bluesy, funky thing called uh, green chili stew, yeah. where I use my, um, I, where is it? Yeah, it's over there. I use I use my Stratocaster, and it's it's really when you go see me in concert, you see me this up side of me, but you don't always hear it on records. And I brought in uh, on saxophone uh, a, a young guy that I've been mentoring and produced his album, uh, name of Tony Craddock Jr. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tony is like. You know, he's a lot younger than me. <laughs> he was super <laughs> off listening to me. And his, fa his father was the one playing, mm -hmm. playing um, wow. music. Mm -hmm. And he grew up listening to me. And, and um, so he and I became friends. I mentored, I still mentor him. And I, I'm very proud that he's chosen me to be the one to do that because he's a very unusual young man with a lot of talents. But anyway, I brought him to play on that. There's some other things on there where I brought in um, a couple really great, uh, what I guess you might call fusion jazz players. Dave Weckl, the drummer, who's played with Chick Corea for many years, and John Patitucci, the bassist who's been with Wayne Shorter and all kinds of people. And they, they played on a song. Um, and so that, you know, I brought in all these different things that I've done over the years and incorporated them in such a way that I feel like it flows as one mm -hmm. and makes a statement, you know, for it being this this kind of landmark recording for me. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I'm yeah. Gonna start with the orchestral background, uh, what uh, kind of logistics were needed <laughs> <laughs> to yep. get it? Not, this is not simple. Nope. You know, not only financially, but just all the logistics involved. Yeah. Joyce, I'll awesome. tell you, I mean, the parking was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, you have that many people. The yeah. thing I don't think about with a jazz quartet or quintet, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think about that stuff. We don't have to worry there'll be enough bathrooms. We don't have to worry there'll be enough parking. Right. You know? I literally had a guy there who was helping out people. Um, one of the cellists got there like she was couldn't find a parking spot. And 15 minutes before, she's like in there with her cello going, I can't park my car. And everybody's set up and really ready to go. And this guy's job was just to say, get in there, warm up, give me your keys. And that was his okay. job to make sure. So yeah, the logistics were, were tricky. It, the preparation was critical because when you have that many people, 
you know when you watch the power meter outside your house when it gets mm-hmm. round and round and you go this is costing me a fortune yeah. that's what it was like um wow. all those players it was costing a lot per hour so preparation if it saved five minutes it was worth it to do because five minutes might cost you three hundred dollars mm-hmm. right uh, you know and that meant that i had to prepare all of the scores all of the parts in such a way that everybody that they were what I call bulletproof. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody <laughs> raised their hand with a question, Are, is this right or do you mean that? I was 110% sure to guess, yes, that's right, and I do mean that next. <laughs> Once a few people start raising their hands um, and questioning and they find a mistake, everybody starts doing that and you're paying for that just the same as if you're playing. So it was very prepared. I brought in a great uh, conductor from Los Angeles, uh, who was an old friend, who was the perfect blend of knowing jazz, but knowing these kinds of classical musicians. And of course, the orchestra was handpicked. These were not, these were not, you know, classical in the bad sense of the word. They were people who knew how to do anything. Right. And were very into jazz, and so they. We very carefully cast that. <laughs> so, yes. And I must say, it was kind of a pleasure to go back more to the way I normally work, which is with a, a band and a group of people. And, you know, I'm not addressing 50 people. I'm, I'm talking to my good four friends that I've played with for, for decades, you know. So it was kind of nice to go back to that. But all of those new things I learned how to do, all of those new sounds, I was constantly trying to find ways to incorporate them when they made sense. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple pieces on the album. There's one song called The Elegance of You that I wrote for my wife. uh, That's that the harpist on the album is a jazz harpist, a very unusual thing, because not only can she play beautifully on the harp, but she can she's got groove. Who's the harpist? Her name is Lori Andrews. Okay. So yeah. She played, okay. On, she played on all the cuts on music yeah. from an orchestra, but I felt like I had just started to find out what I might be able to do with that instrument. So I wrote a, a piece just for her and I mm-hmm. called The Elegance of You, and that's on the album. And I'm really proud of that. It's a beautiful piece, and um, it, it came off really well. And it fits into the album in such a way that it's a, you know, a natural flow. Right. So, um, so you know, like I say, there's plenty of things that are very much contemporary jazz, smooth jazz, the things that people um, are know of me. But then there's other things that cross that line. It's, you know, they're, they bridge something, <laughs> you know, which is what I've always felt like jazz should be. You, um, know, you know what? Let's take you back. Let's take you back to 2014. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ruby Lane, you had two hits off that album. The title track, Ruby Lane. Mm-hmm. and uh, Unbreakable Heart. Mm-hmm. There was something personal. I remember you shared it with me about this album. Can you talk about that album? Because that's one of my favorites. Oh, thank you. Well, that 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 was an important album to me, too. They all are, as I said. But yeah. it, that Ru- Ruby is the, you know, the, the I guess, the, uh, the jewel for your 40th anniversary. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, my wife and I were married 40 years in 2014. And that's where that song came from. And that's where a lot of the inspiration on the record came from. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I feel very for, I got married very young. And, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't really know that much. (laughs) That much mistake. I feel very fortunate that it worked out so well, because in a way, you know, you follow your instincts when you're 19 years old, but sometimes your instincts are not that good. But that was, that was a very good one. And uh, so that's where that album was coming from. Dreaming of Trains, What not isn't that a, a Chris Standering remake or was it Jeff Golub? I don't know. I've never heard anybody yeah. use that title besides yeah. me, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure you know better than me. Yeah, um, yeah I didn't know that. Um, yeah, Dreaming of Trains was was the second of two albums I did that were were kind of a departure for me. Um, there were things on them that were real groove oriented, but there were each song on those, on, the first of those two albums was The Grace of Summer Light and then Dreaming yeah. of Trains came after yeah. that. 
And I was very much into trying to tell stories with each song, like long, like linear right. stories. Um, and, uh, you know, that was Dreaming of Trains was sort of the second installment of that <laughs> phase. But I'm still doing that. I'm still doing that, but I'm not doing it exclusively. You know, yeah. I'm not looking at it like, like um, you know, I still love the song form. Like I was saying before we turned on the YouTube, I, I you know, I grew up with Motown and then discovered yeah. all the, yeah. the rock of the 60s. And uh, it was just a great time to, you know, to, to the 60s to, to, to find out about music. And then all of that stuff culminated with me hearing West Montgomery mm. and Butch yeah. Benson and just, you know, oh, that's where I need to go next. Right. And, um, but that journey keeps, you know, it keeps, it keeps going. Uh, if you're lucky, it keeps going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, you have been sending down some fantastic music and you got the new video out. Mm-hmm. Okay, with the new track. Yeah, with When We Dance, yeah. When We Dance. And the video, the video, it shows the true essence, the heart and soul of Ken Navarro. You know, and it's like, I'm glad a lot of people are watching today so mm-hmm. they can finally put a face, you know, to the name. But that video, it just... It just shows your heart and soul. It, I, I tried. You know, it's interesting. We, I don't. I'm not shy about admitting that I'm. You know, the chief. What's the expression? Chief cook and bottle washer. There you go. I, you know, I'm not <laughs> shy about that. Head cook and bottle washer. <laughs> yeah, I, I mangle those things all the time. But. That's okay. You're forgiven. <laughs> My wife gives me a little grief about that, but anyhow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, what you're watching when you're watching that video is I'm the one who came up with the set. I'm the one who turned on the camera. I'm the one, and then I had to perform, you know? So, but when it comes to playing, you, you just kind of forget yourself, you know? You forget about, the, where is the camera working? And you just, you just get into the music and that's what I always try to do. And I feel like those kinds of videos, you know, I know people, they make these really produced videos and they cost a lot of money. <laughs> And I don't think that's what people really want to watch. I think they want to find the thing that gets at what you said, Joe, the heart and soul of it. Yeah. And oftentimes that's somebody just playing in in an environment that's not all dressed up, you know? And, right. And, you know, um, yeah. I had a, a guy came to me, he saw a video, one of my videos, and he said, oh, somebody should do a really good video of you. You deserve a really good video. So I said, okay, I'll do it for free, you know? And he did it. Long story short, he did a beautiful job. Long story short, it gets about a tenth of the views that my own videos get. Because I just think that that more direct communication is what, you know, this is all about now. Right. I'm glad it spoke to you that way. It's like that third dimension that you're trying to communicate to the audience through your music. Now you get that now third dimension of your heart and soul do video. Oh yeah, and I picked that up right away when I saw the video. It, it, it completed the circle. Thank you. You know, it's, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. It's that third dimension. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, that's how I like to do it. And I I, I have six more coming. I'm just gonna put up from this new album. One's with me and Lori. And it's oh, kind of okay. cool because she's in LA. I like to see so that. we filmed our parts yeah. separately. And I found a cool way to put them together so it feels very much like we're in sympathy with each other. And it, it, so that's another one. There's one for Green Chili Stew oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and a few more. There's one of, of the Grace of Summer Light remix that I did where I really brought the rhythm section out. So it's a more driving groove now. And I have a whole thing of the whole orchestra that was done with me playing and, and that. So I'm looking forward to putting them out. I have to be patient. That's the thing about cre- the creative thing. You, The creative and the marketing don't always jive too well because the creative right. one goes, I want everybody to see everything now. Mm-hmm. And not too much too fast. That's right. And I've had to be very patient with rolling them out and um, and control myself, you know, because I just, I'm into the, the, the music, you know, and yeah. the, right. the way of sharing it. And, um, but I have learned that, that you know, the marketing is important because yeah. that's what we have now for people to discover it. So, yeah. mm-hmm. okay. What, what do you think for um, people uh, is the most uh, 
efficient marketing tool? Is it social network? Is it word of mouth? What do you think? Well, that is yes, I think to me it's the social. I've learned a lot on my own just about how to get information out there. And Facebook now is some very, um, very deep um, marketing, uh, paid marketing that you can do for really very little money relative to what it would cost. I mean, remember, I've been running a label since 1990, so 30 years. We used to take out very expensive ads and magazines mm -hmm. and have no idea if they were really hitting their target. Right. No uh, analytics, right? <laughs> and no analytics, and Facebook is the opposite of that. Right. So I just did a four four different ad campaign over the last four days that ended today. I will begin the next one on Tuesday of this coming week, mm -hmm. and I'll be able to look at all that data. And I was marketing to people all over the world, and not just to smooth jazz taste, but because this album has a lot of different things on it marketing to people who go a little more in the fusion jazz side and who know who Dave Weckl is. And, you know, yeah. People like Dave Weckl have a half a million followers on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Why leave that audience out, you know, um, right. of this? And so um, it's a challenge when, you're, when your music is deep and has a lot of scope, mm -hmm. but Facebook makes it possible to figure that out. And what I'll do now, and long way of saying it, I'll be able to study what happened with those four ad campaigns. They reached 50,000 people total, wow. but how many did they, did what? How many looked at the video for five seconds? How many, you know, and mm -hmm. on, on like that. And so that's, that's the kind of thing. So I, I tend to believe in that now, you know, the print media, uh, all that stuff. It's really about how hard you're willing to work. And we were talking, you know, before the cameras went on too about having to learn new things. I, I like doing that. I, I, it makes me feel like I'm not going to get senile. <laughs> you know, I'm trying. No. Um, yeah, you know, so, so, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I think social media to me, and within social media, YouTube is now falling into that right. to some degree. And, um, all of those things, but it takes work and you have to mm -hmm. kind of leave the music. I'm not doing any music right now. I'm practicing every day because I'm going to do a, um, I don't accept a lot of performance gigs now, but I accepted one in Mallorca, Spain. They have a big smooth jazz festival they do every yeah. year in May. So I'm prepared <laughs> for that. And I'm I, everything first thing in the morning at 630, I play till 830 every day. I, but then I, then I put my attention to working this album mm -hmm. and making sure that people find out about what I did for the last year and a half. And, and um, so not every musician is oriented that way. Uh, I think they kind of think it's beneath them. But to me, why did I go to all that trouble and all that work and, and really put my heart and soul into it if I'm not going to put at least some close equivalent to that into people finding out about it, especially now that there are ways for you to do that. Right. That you can, you can feel like you're not throwing money away. Right. Uh, so, so anyway, wow. that's my Wow. Opinion. You're the perfect artist to work with. I'm so, I'm so glad, I don't know about the listeners, but everything that you just said is like, I was wondering if I, if I were weird because when I get booked, even out of state, and I, I don't have any followers, I'm trying to communicate and get followers and use social media. And yeah. sometimes I feel like they think I'm weird. Well, why, why do you want to do that? Why do you need to know this? That's how I feel, whether they say that or not. And because I think it's a win-win situation. I'm, I'm, you know, I, was, I didn't have any followers in a certain city I'm going to. Now I have over 500 because I put the marketing effort in reach and yeah. reach. Um, uh, that's so great to hear. It really is because, yeah. because you know, it, it used to be, and because I did this too. When, when I started out in 1990, when I, I, I made a, an audience in a city by going there and playing a free gig, back free, it cost me money because I had to pay my band, but I do a free gig for 50 people. Then the next time I'd break even for a hundred people. And then the next time I'd make a little money for 200 people. And then I would start to connect. Right. It That's so good to hear. But it, it took. But, there's um, artists listening now, and it's good that you say that, that you're sharing that, yeah, because yeah. we have independent artists who are listening too. So thank but you. Now we have what you're talking about, George, which is the ability to to reach out to that city without having to physically go there 
-hmm. and maybe the dues won't be quite as high what you have to pay you know to make to, to create an audience in, in Charlotte North Carolina or Seattle Washington or wherever it is and um, you know the other thing I did a fair amount of at one point was living room concerts I said that's fine with me they, they would pay me and and I would make money doing it but it, I it, I'd only play for maybe 40 or 50 people but the quality of those 40 50 people and who they would tell yeah. you know so it's important for artists especially in the jazz community to understand that what we're doing is special and it's not and I say this not in an exclusive way but it's it's not for everybody it's right. for people who really listen right and you know the thing one thing you brought up jazz where I would say I'll go as far as say we are elitist because we take our music is for it's a specific genre for a specific audience but when talking to Joyce talking to you and one thing Joyce brought up about social media you brought up about marketing where we used to have with the big artists MCA Atlantic mm -hmm. where you had a marketing department a media department a cover art department and now it's a mom and pop thing mm -hmm. right okay. where you're doing everything online so for Joyce and you CD baby mm -hmm. just closed shop now we've got Spotify, Amazon Music, okay. But now my question is, for self marketing and self advertising, Joyce, Ken, is that closing going to affect you? Well, that I got to tell you, that's the first I've heard of that. My checks keep coming from CD Baby. Yeah, I was you said, say the they, same thing. <laughs> good. <laughs> so you're saying they're they're actually closing? This is the first I've heard of it. Yeah, we got CD yeah. Baby is closing, and yeah, I don't really know I, why. I, because the physical CD, I've been wondering. I put I you know because I heard about the logistics of you using the full orchestra and expense. Even well, I, for one, right. for one, Joe, I mean, before we put that out, I mean, you don't have no, I mean, are, do you have some proof of that? Yeah, I'll send, yeah, I'll Because send I had, I mean, I would imagine they would, <laughs> people that's underneath <laughs> CD Baby, <laughs> would, they would get the information, with, they, they would get the information before you would, Joe, so well, I, I, would I, don't that, I don't think that's, I don't think that's correct, I don't think that's correct. <laughs> is it possible that what they're closing is their CD element? Their yeah. art? Because they've got an incredible di digital distribution thing going. I, yeah. I make very little money from them from selling CDs to them. Right. I act, We still actually have a distributor for our CDs. Right. Believe it or not, and this surprised me as much as anybody, um, but I, uh, five weeks before the album came out, I'd already sold out our initial run of CDs. Mm -hmm. To right. the man, to the distributor, to customers, to you know, I had to make more. And the day after more came in, our distributor ordered a few hundred more. Mm -hmm. right. So there are this audience is still buying CDs. Right. They're never gonna buy them. And you know what? Let me back up. Thanks, Gary. Let me back up. The word I got from a reliable source is their retail is closing. Right. Okay. That's the yeah, word I, I got. Yeah. And you know what? I apologize to artists and audience. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking out right now. Oh, no, 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 they have Copa, they have Copa, they have Maxi. That makes sense, Joe, because you got to wonder how they keep storing all that. You know, I know for me, and I do pretty well with CD Baby. I, I mean, if I sell five CDs through CD Baby a month, that's right. that's a lot, you know. But now, that's is that just is the closing of the retail? Is that going to affect Joyce, you, and how, is that going to affect you guys? Or that's my question. I have to read more. There's a big article here on Variety. Uh, yeah. When you go, Variety.com has, has an article. And of course, I can't read it while we're on the air. Right. So I need to read that to see. Yeah, what they're doing. Uh, I right. mean, I have another distributor here in the Dallas area. And if I may have to check that out. What yeah. I think what it, what it will do, it will, it will force us to look at other options. Yeah. Well, that's, as I say, we've always had a distributor because we, we just... We just segued with the distributor into these things that have changed, and they are still right. selling. Molten, <laughs> Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, right. Amazon's probably their biggest biggest thing, but right. they sell them to one stop store too. And you know, they're 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 definitely um, out there. Uh, but we use a distributor for that. That's why CD Baby does. That won't affect me very much. Their their stopping of retail CDs, although. Right. You know, I mean, I I liked it that they did it. I'm sorry they're not, but you know, mm -hmm. um, 
we'll 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 see where they go from here. But I, I I'm sure they're going to keep their digital thing happening. Oh yeah, right. they do a great job at that, at that in my opinion. Yeah, um, yeah. Glad to have that doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Some. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ken, I tell you what, yeah, man. Let's have our listeners check out one of the songs. Yeah, that's what I was just getting ready to get that's into. Good. Um, so Ken, uh, <laughs> the the in, I guess the name of the actual CD is uh, Into the Light, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, baby. So, yeah, baby. Yeah. So what I thought I thought what we would do, uh, we would go ahead and start out with that particular track first. Right. Yeah, the title track. Sure. Yeah. Could you go ahead and give us a little bit of a story on this? Before. gladly yeah uh, as far as the musicians that's those that great rhythm section i was talking about greg and gary granger yeah. if you remember you remember the, the incredible motown bass player james jamerson he played on all those mo i mean the guy listen to the bass parts they're yeah. just yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. gary is the modern version of james jamerson and you just listen to that i always try to mix him in a way that to make sure everybody can hear every note he played uh -huh. part of the funk brothers wonderful I'm sorry, Joe. Part of the Funk Brothers. Uh, yes, that's right. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, and then, so, and my longtime uh, keyboardist, Jay Rowe, uh, who kind of plays with everybody, yeah. he's on. <laughs> and uh, there's a really great, um, you know, living in the D.C. area, there's a ton of excellent uh, service musicians. Yeah. These are the, the, I mean, they're really good. And, and. A uh, saxophonist I've been working with a long time named Rob Holmes, who is the leader of what's called the Navy Commodores, which is the Navy um, uh, jazz nice. band. And they're yeah. amazing players. Um, he plays sax on it. So this song just came out of, I, I whenever I start writing music for a new album, it's kind of mm -hmm. like rubbing two sticks together. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> and to the Light was the first song that i was warmed up it just i went in and i started writing and it came out yeah it was like a really happy day because up yeah. until that point i was working real hard and that that so that's why i called it into the light it just sort of felt like a, it burst forward and um was sort of the fruition of the labor that that came before it so awesome. that's more or less the story of that song okay awesome well we're gonna let our listeners check it all out and uh, of course and then if you're just tuning in of course we are talking to ken navarro and uh, we're getting ready to listen to one of the uh, selections right now. And it's Into uh, the Light. And uh, so y'all keep it locked and we'll be right back with you right here on the Indie Live Spot.
musicians, but you're great people. And you're just so... I don't know how... I think it's always amazing when I run into a musician who plays really, you know, engaging, warm, embracing music, and they're kind of a cold fish. It's always amazing to me, you know, but it's because that's where it comes out. It's there. It's just, they don't do it in conversation. They do it with an instrument, you know, and with an audience. But but those, again, I feel that that's the exception to the rule generally, at least in jazz, at least in jazz. I, I don't know, you know. Um, when I lived in LA, I worked on a show just on that. <laughs> we are on. We are We're on. on. Hey. We are. So. Ken, real quick, before anyone else um, asks you a question, I'm glad you brought up that you played in the living room since so somebody mm-hmm. wanted you that they, you know, that you guys would work out the, you know, the scheduling and whatnot and the pay. Mm-hmm. Um, are you still doing that or has that stopped? I, I'm still doing it. Those, ironically, those kinds of gigs almost always turn out great. It's a oh, yeah. total listening environment. The people are primed. Um, it, it, um, what I tend to shy away from are the gigs now where you go and you play with a house band. And it's really tough for me, especially as my music's gotten more and more sophisticated. I just, Mm -hmm. I I don't really want to take those gigs, quite honestly. But the living room ones are almost always solo. I'll play with track. And I had a solo record back in 2013, I guess, called The Test of Time. So I have a a solo repertoire. But I'll play with track. I have no, nobody minds that in a living room. Right. I can play anything I want to. I can play one of the songs with the orchestra, Joyce. You know, you I'm a concert, <laughs> you know. Um, but so I've done living room concerts from Seattle to Detroit to uh, 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 in Virginia, uh, Roanoke, Virginia. I, it's brought me places that I normally wouldn't wouldn't necessarily go. I played in Seattle otherwise. I played in Detroit many times otherwise, but. You know, it's brought me at certain places where there's no club to play, you know, or no no venue that would have you really, and and it's always gone great. So yes, the the short answer to the question is yes. I, I'm somebody just wrote me a week ago asking me if I would come back and do another living room concert. There was some, somebody who lived outside of Atlanta, and I said for you, absolutely, because it's such an experience, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, because they're 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 there to see you. They want you there. Yeah, and they They're set so a wonderful dead. environment for for the music, and they they don't invite people who aren't going to get it. They invite exactly their best friends who they think are, are work people. And I don't know. I've just like I say, I've never had a bad living room concert experience. And you think that it could be right for problems, right? You know, but oh. it really hasn't been. And, and of course, you know, I feel like I make a new friend too. Um, right. Some of those people we actually have seen away from music business. Some mm-hmm. friends of ours in Seattle, they brought me back three times. They weren't friends before. In fact, the last one I did was me and, and uh, Jeff Koshua did one together. Yeah. Um, who's a good friend well, of mine. He's in the Seattle area, right? Yes, that's why that's I thought okay. him. He's also a musician I love, but it, yeah. Oh, well, this will save them money. They don't have to fly him in. They, he, he'll just exactly. drive in a minute. You have to and so he's in not, but yeah. he's, uh, um, uh, they these folks became friends, and um, a couple of years ago they came and visited us here and stayed with us. Mm-hmm. And the year after that we went out to where they were and and we spent a few days visiting and staying with them. And and it just, you know, that's that's a pretty nice thing to see, have that happen. Absolutely. So, yeah. Ken, hey, let me throw <laughs> some names. Let me throw some names at you. Sure. John Clemmer. Pat well, Lattini. Oh man. Well, Laura Nero. <laughs> oh, well, all right. <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. They've all had a big influence on me. Uh, I did an album in 2005 called Love Colored Soul, and it was that was a lyric out of a Laura Nero song. Yeah. Um, buried in a song, but nevertheless, uh, she's one of those people. A lot of people don't know who she is. They know her songs. Because the Fifth Dimension had huge hits, and yeah. Blood, Sweat, and Tears had a huge hit with one of hers, and but she's a was a a, a unique moment in time and music, and um, 
So she's been an influence of nothing else, just the spirit of what she's about and, and the braveness of going anywhere in one song. She'd go three different places. <laughs> uh, but uh, Pat Metheny has been a humongous influence because he's of my age. We were born one year apart. Um, he was an inspiration, not just for the music, but seeing that you could take jazz and bridge it into another audience and, he takes and not talk music, down right? to the audience. Right. You, know? you didn't right. have to play it simple. Right. Um, right. Thank and, you. Uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, the, who was the last name you mentioned? John Clemmer, Barefoot Ballet. Oh, Clemmer. Yeah. Well, I even covered one. I'm updating you now. <laughs> no, that's okay. That album, Touch, was a breakthrough because when I heard Touch, yeah. I was in college hanging out with nothing but jazz bows. And everybody was real exclusive about not playing anything but straight ahead jazz. Your, your dad would have been very comfortable with us, Joe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, I, <laughs> I, and yeah. I said, I don't know. I like this. And mm -hmm. people said, it's not cool. It's not it's not real jazz. And what and, and the, the coolest guy said, oh, no, 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 that's good. It's good. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, swings or not. Yeah. And uh, so that was a breakthrough record for me. And I, on that album, I just referred to of mine, uh, Love Colored Soul. Um, I, I did it one of the songs from Touch on it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I really love bringing a lot of different influences together and coming up with my own stew, which at this point I'm pretty confident it sounds like me. But I love being able to go back and say, what about that Touch record? which I hadn't listened to yeah. for 20 years. <laughs> and I listened to it and it inspired me to make Love Colored Soul because Touch was an album of, yeah. uh, of I don't know, healing, you know? And I said, I want to make an album that's just like a healing kind of a record and go that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making babies also. <laughs> uh, the only my oldest, my oldest son. Not there. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I? The only problem which I found with that from, as an artist is that then you get an audience who wants you to keep making that record over and over yeah, again. Yeah, no. It's very yeah. popular, and I just keep moving to the next thing. It doesn't mean you won't hear me roll around, you know, back. You'll hear things like that on this new album, you know, um, Into the Light. You'll definitely hear things that you go, oh man, he hasn't done one like that in a while, you know? But the fact is that um, it, I feel so blessed to get to do this music we call jazz for a lifetime. And I would feel like I was not being very appreciative of that gift if I didn't keep learning and growing and expanding. And, uh, and I just keep trying to make it as accessible as possible because that's the lesson I learned from Pat Metheny. You don't have to talk down, um, but you have to make people feel. They have to, it has to be deep. And if it doesn't come deep within you and your soul, I. I you can't expect other people to feel something deep within themselves and their soul if you didn't if it didn't start with you. Mm -hmm. My son is a is a he's a child psychologist, but he does stand up comedy five nights a week. Oh, and so I would say to him, to him if, if you don't think it's hilarious, I don't know why you're trying to tell that joke in front of people because if you don't think it's great, how do you why are they gonna laugh? You know, so right. Right. what was your right. mindset behind the Tiananmen album? Tell, tell well, the that thing. song, that was on my very first album, which right. was, which came out in 1990. Well, Tiananmen Square was fresh. You know, we watched that right. on, on TV, even if the Chinese people didn't, we did. And um, I was just trying to make a sound picture of what it looked like to me, what it sounded like to me. There's right. some elements of that. I don't know if I'd ever record anything like that again. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose as we expand our music into China, I'll have to keep that one hidden for a while. Uh, it's, you know, it's not a complimentary sound picture, I don't think, to what was well, going on. You know, you're a Ken, if you have to be a Ken Navarro mm -hmm. uh, aficionado, and the song, it really didn't hit, but mm -hmm. for some of us that follow you, mm -hmm. it, it held a deep meaning. Right. And for the events that happened in China, Right. And it was put to music in a way that showed us your artistry and your style. That's what I took from it. Well, Joe, I, I got to tell you, I've done a lot of interviews. I've done on the phone, in print, 
no one has ever brought up that song. Yeah. And I truly appreciate that more than I can really express. Oh, it's in my place. What you're saying about it, because, you know, it meant a lot to me, but I kind of knew it was a deep album cut. I knew it when I did it. Mm. Um, but um, on the other hand, isn't that what this music is about? You know, um, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, we have we have the songs that we that lead a record. Like when we dance is is doing a great job of leading this record for me. But it's, you know, there's the, the, there's a lot of uh, the deeper things are, are. And so when you bring that up, that that makes me feel really makes my day. Touch the nerve, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, definitely yeah. A, a, an art form. I'm glad that you didn't let anybody else. Um, uh, build a box for you to get in, if you know what I mean. Because some people will build a box and say, you know what, you look like you should sound uh, like yes, this. I've been down that like road. This. <laughs> Have you ever recorded an album for, for a label, Joyce? Or have you no, done it all on your own? Independent. Yeah. yeah. Well, I did, I did, I guess, how many? 12, I think, on my own. And mm -hmm. then I was signed by a label called Shanaki that's still out there. In mm -hmm. fact, I think the Brian Simpson, uh, Steve Oliver record is on Shanaki. Yeah. And and it was a little tricky for me, frankly, because I was used to calling the shots total. Mm -hmm. And they began to want to name the songs and they began to want to say yes to that one, no to that one. We need more of this. And I found that I, I actually started just kind of trying to stay in a certain lane. Conform. And I, I, you know, I, that's, that's not a really good thing for an artist to do in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the end, I mean, we, we parted ways amicably and we both had success from it. I did two albums from them and then I went back and I did the next, I did my next 12 albums on my own again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for me, I think at this point to, to not have that independence, you know, and not, and, because I know what it feels like when it, you start defining the four walls. Mm. When I defined them, it's one thing. When Love Colored Soul, I defined them. I knew that I didn't want anything that took us outside of that healing thing, you know, that touch vibe that, that right. I remembered from 1975. Yeah. Um, but that was my decision. I, and so the, all of that music came from my heart and deep within. I wasn't trying to get a radio station to add it. You know, I wasn't trying to write something that was so somebody would play it or manipulate an audience member to like it because it reminded them of something else that mm -hmm. they liked. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what happens when it comes from you. Um, you can define those walls and then it, it's real. It's not it's not a, a, mm -hmm. a manipulation in any way. And right. you know, oh, well, I appreciate that a it's lot. Kind of, it's kind of like an artist back mm -hmm. the art of picasso he paints because he feels something he sees something mm -hmm. he paints it for you know his satisfaction then he dies it becomes famous but mm -hmm. and i'm seeing you can take and make the same uh uh with musicians musicians are artists in my book anyway you know mm -hmm. what's in your head what's in your heart what's in your mind and you do have a lot of the record companies that are saying, well, no, we want to put this on. We want to put that. And then with you artists, you're saying, but I want the audience to hear this from my heart, like when we dance, okay? <laughs> that that track, like I said, coming from you again, it's showing the heart and the soul. But here's the thing I want to ask you about. Now, a lot of your albums, there's not too many vocalists that I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't used vocals in, in quite a while. I, I, I tried it a few times. You know, the irony, Joe, is that, believe it or not, when I was in college, I went to music school, but they didn't have anything for what they called guitar back guitar. then. <laughs> so I was a voice major. I actually was a voice major for four years in, in college. Okay. Um, I'm nowhere the, the singer that I am a guitarist. Um, but um, so there's always been an interest in it for me, you know, because singing is what went hand in hand with what music was to me as I grew up. It wasn't until I got into jazz that I dedicated myself to the guitar and um, everything to do with that. So I don't know. I, I think it's something I should revisit now because now that I'm it's been so long, I don't think I would approach it the same way. I probably wouldn't look at adding a voice 
to do a typical song, I'd probably look at adding a voice as another instrument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and which doesn't mean there wouldn't be lyrics, but I would view it more like an equal partner. And that's the other thing that sort of scared me away a little bit with vocals is I felt like, well, then that becomes the focal point. The focal point. And I'm accompanying that. Right. right. Trying to stick my two cents in where maybe it's not necessary because it's my song. And, um, you know, there's got to be a way to, that's a good challenge. Write a right. song that uses the voice in a traditional way but really feels like it's a partnership with the guitar. Yeah. Uh, and not a, you know, right. this is here and this is back here, and it comes out and does a solo, and then it goes, you know. Right. Uh, so. Well, you know, but you still got to take that chance. Lee Rittenauer, he was instrumental for a long time, and then he put out two hits. I think it was Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Right. And uh, Forget Me Nots. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he did Papa Was a Rolling Stone, did that live, and that thing just shot out the chart. So what I hear you saying is you're a little bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I am. But, yeah, you're a little bit hesitant. That's yeah. what I hear. But you, I think there's, you're so far advanced in your career. What the hell? Let's give it a try and see what right. happens. Right. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> it's, it's a musical challenge for sure, and that is... That is how I tend to write. I write down like an idea and uh, as a question, as in this question would be, is it possible to write a vocal tune and have a vocalist right. and I coexist on an equal foot? <laughs> that would be a question mark. And then I go back trying to do it. I, sometimes it takes two or three before I get the one, you know? Hey, it's no problem backing up into the background. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you. I think you should do it, and I think would be quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rick McLaurin uh, sent me a track that was done. He yeah. said See, you can put some sax on this one or whatever you want to do, and I said okay. So I I worked both tracks. Long story short, right. yeah. that album got a Grammy consideration. Wow! And uh, so and you're, you're I, on it. Yeah, and I'm on it. And I was like, it took me like six, nine months later. I said, oh, I need to put that on my website. That's part of my bio now. <laughs> I forgot Absolutely. all about it. It didn't know, occur to me. You never know, right? The things that might come up that, that you don't think anything about them when you're doing yeah. them. And then they turn out to be very important. Right, um, right. And yeah. so I said, oh, I need to, because I saw other artists listing that. And I yeah. thought, I don't even list it. Why, why am I not doing that? You that, should. That well, you are. <laughs> yeah, so that that was exciting, but I, I'm enjoying this so much, especially about the living room, because that's right, a big right. this afternoon. So when I exit early, you'll know why. I have oh, a, that's what, right, right. So it's a Mardi Gras jazz celebration. Uh, so uh, doing that. So and I do several of those, and I and it's it's so good to hear you say that. And I, again, I don't I don't mean to be redundant, but other artists who are in the chat room, like Henry Mixon and. Um, David McLaurin might be there too, y Yvonne J. Several of them in the chat room chatting uh, as as um, they listen to your interview. And we we need to hear that from someone of your caliber. So Thank we can well, I'm, good ideas and know that what we're doing, that we're not so weird. <laughs> not at all. And, and man, I mean, everybody knows that being able to touch people and see it is so powerful as a performer. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is a reason to, to reach out. But then mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know, having come up in 1990, starting a record label, when that was not, that was a weird thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it turns <laughs> yeah. out I, I was right, but it was a, we, you know, we were not, we were out there on our own. Yeah. Uh, literally, you know, bringing, bringing things, uh, you know, into the public from from no nothing to something, and uh, but anyway, having done that, I just really appreciate all these opportunities that we have now as artists mm -hmm. because they just weren't there before. You know, you just didn't have any other way to do it. I think before we were we went live, I was talking about how we used to have a listening line that was an 800 number, right. and we we would publicize that with expensive print ads. Then people would call an 800 number and listen. That was how they would sample your new record. Love it. Yep. You know? I remember uh, doing that. So I Watch appreciate you all these yourself. things. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Okay. Yeah. Again, another yeah. Let, let me can. ask you this. Let me ask you this. Since, yeah. you know, we brought them back all back in the day. Now, this is actually your first interview on a Skype. 
-hmm. doing this, isn't it? Yes, very first. Ray, you, we can't see bad. your face. Yes, we're losing you, Ray. Uh, I see your face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean only, only see your eyes. There you okay. are. Okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> But uh, what do you think about this this type of format? I love you this. Know? I mean, the minute you guys all came on the screen, I see, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, the minute you guys all came on the screen like this, uh, you know, uh, including Gary. <laughs> for, Gary's a circle for me. I don't know how he is for you guys. You well, guys same thing, same yeah. thing. And I went, oh, man, this is great. You know, I, <laughs> I actually teach uh, a, a couple people, one of them's in uh, – in St. Louis, and uh, another one is out on the West Coast with Skype, um, and so I'm not completely not used to it. But but this is great. I mean, I I don't know how it is for you, but uh, it feels very natural to me. Yeah. And um, you know, it, until something freezes, you know, if I go like yeah. this, <laughs> it comes back in a second or two. I know. Well, I see that. Uh, yeah. end, so. But I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Gary Fuston is the He's one. And this yeah. is his brainchild in other Gary. words. Yay, Gary. <laughs> he took care of everything. And I that's why it's all working well. Yeah, know? and he's had to make some changes along the way as YouTube made changes. He had to shut down and make some uh, changes, changes himself. So if it weren't for Gary and his assistant, Griselda, Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be here, you know, doing this, their efforts, and, uh, but everything, the, the heart of it is in Gary Houston's place in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. I just show up and talk. My job is easy. Right, right. <laughs> well, you guys are making this very easy for we me. We love you, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is still no. Oh. You, Joyce. <laughs> well, well, children. Kitties, Ray Mac have to run. I got to go get this other computer so I can get it set up over All here. All right, Mac. All right. right. We'll see Good you later. you. All right, then. All right. I hope we'll see y'all again. See you later, Ray Mac. All right, Mac. Good weekend. All right, baby. We'll catch you. Well, what I noticed in your bio is that you've been doing this for over 30 years. Yeah, I just... All over the world, major cities. Yeah. What is your most memorable experience? Tell me what's the most memorable. Yeah. There've been a lot, I have to say. I went to, been to Japan a few times and and uh, did a really um, fun gig with Eric Marienthal over there together and uh, the saxophonist. And um, probably the most memorable was there's a place in in um, uh, in Philadelphia, an outdoor venue, um, and. I can't believe I'm gonna have to look it up. Pen something. It's right on the water. Uh, when there was a station there, um, they would put on these shows on Friday, and uh, on Fridays in the summer. And we would get there at two o'clock to do our sound check. There'd be a thousand people already camped out waiting. Wow. And by the time the show happened, it was three thousand people, hmm. maybe more. And the most memorable experience I ever had was was there, because I have a song of mine that was also on my first album called Try Again that has been expanded into this 12 minute um, uh, cathartic piece. And I always go out into the audience with my wireless and I did that and it was just unbelievable. I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. Mm. To have just right there with me in a setting like that and people from every walk of life. I don't know, it was just, I just felt like how lucky am I to f get to feel this from the inside of this experience. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you're part of a big crowd, you sometimes feel it, but when you're the performer and everywhere you go, it's like this and like, you know, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I do feel the unity of what's happening there and that, that music is what's doing it. And when it happens to be your music at that moment, it's a pretty amazing feeling. And so, you know, it was partly the magnitude of it, the, how many people, but it was also the intimacy of it. Um, and uh, and I have to tell you, I didn't, there were there were a couple bodyguards who were behind me, like with worried looks on their face. I wasn't thinking about that for a minute. You know, I, I knew everything was fine. You just know when everything's okay. Yeah. And um, anyway, that was a very special moment amongst, I've been lucky to 
have had a few of them, and but that was probably one I most remember. Penn Station, I think it was Penn called. Station. Penn Station. Finally, I got it. Penn Station. Yeah. Now, are you going to be uh, are you going to be uh, hitting the uh, Burks Fest in April? They haven't asked me, so no. Um, I, really? I've done it a few times. They haven't asked me for many years. I don't really know why, frankly. Um, really? Because um, I'm not that far away. <laughs> I can drive there. Um, right. Yeah, and I have plenty of friends who do it every year. And, and okay. yeah, I, I did it probably two or three years, but I haven't done it for probably about, at this point, probably 12 years, I think. Okay, uh, let me make so, some phone calls. I know where the bodies. Please do. Buried. I'd love to do it. <laughs> I know where the yeah. bodies buried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know some of those folks too. They're great people. And yeah, I they're great. You know, they are. For doing something like this year after oh. year, and in fact, if anything, it keeps getting bigger. Mm. Three uh, weeks. Yeah. We're doing, three. Yeah, we're doing we're doing three weeks this uh, oh. April. And uh, I'll be going down and uh, meeting with some of the uh, artists down there. Mm -hmm. And I'm with another company. We're going to be doing uh, on-site interviews and stuff. But, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'll, oh, I'll, that's drop, great. I'll drop a word. You're nice to do that. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate yeah. that because it's at this point it feels funny to keep pushing. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about it, man. They know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I <know. laughs> hey, Gary, yeah. do we have another? We have some more music from Ken yeah. for our audience. Yes, yeah, so I was just okay. going to say that uh, before we do play another one, before we uh, came back from the first music break, we did also play um, Walking Each Other Home. So I wanted, oh, cool. yeah, I wanted you to tell us a little bit yeah. about that one as well, and then yeah, uh, and then we'll go yeah. to the other. Um, one. Yeah, that's. Um, I have to think a little bit about the origins of that. Because um, that was also written when I was in the midst of a lot of music coming out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the one thing I will say about that, again, it has the great rhythm section of Gary Granger and Greg Granger, uh, yeah. Greg on drums and Gary on bass. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it also has a full horn section on it, which is, which is very cool because, you know, these days people don't really do that. They, they tend to use really good virtual instruments or right. synths stuff mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. but i got like the, some of the best players from the navy commodores oh, uh, nice. the band. Yeah. and uh, and i you know i co-wrote a horn chart with the keyboardist who was on the song whose name is dan lemaestre and he happens to be he was in my band for many years and then he joined the navy commodores became an became a, a, a naval officer with with an instrument he's a pianist so dan and i wrote a horn arrangement he, dan played all the keyboards on that and dan and i wrote the horn arrangements and then brought in rob holmes uh, to do all the saxes and tim stanley a killer trumpet player to do the two trumpet parts and I, it's funny because i did it all the demo i make very elaborate demos of these songs when i'm writing them and some of the players said, well, the horns sound pretty good. Your, your demo horns sound pretty good. I said, there's just, no, there's something about when people do it and the little in idiosyncrasies and the little things that aren't perfect. Yeah. And I said, when it's all there, it's going to add up because it's kind of wall-to-wall horns. They, mm -hmm. they don't play, they play a lot. Yeah. And I said, it's going to add up, and it did. It really made a difference. Oh, and it yeah. gave it. You know, and I called it Walking Each Other Home because there was just something about it that something had been going through my mind, and I guess this is spiritual, that's okay, but had been going through my mind that really what we're doing in this life is we're all basically walking each other home. You know, we're all going through this together, yeah. and, and that's where we're going. And um, I don't know, there was just something about the spirit of the song that felt that way to me, and I thought, that's something you've been thinking? That's the name of this song, you know? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I like that. That's where I came from. Well, what about, because um, the next one we're going to play is uh, When We Dance. Uh, tell us about that one as well. Well, yeah, this one you know, was the very first song I wrote for the album. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was saying, when I first start writing after a big break of writing, because music for guitar and orchestra was all music that I had before, mm -hmm. that I recorded before, but reimagined for an orchestra. And then I wrote all those scores for that. Yeah. So it had been four years since I wrote a new song. And when I first started with this album, it, I, I mean, that two sticks analogy is exactly what it feels like. You're trying to get something, some spark happening, you know. Yeah. But I sit in the room for eight hours a day like a job, and I just write, <laughs> and out comes crap, but I keep going. 
<laughs> Nobody ever hears it, but I just keep going, you know? Well, you know what they say, you can take and sprinkle a turd with powdered sugar, but um, hey, you know. No, no I, I know it's part of the no, song. It's, it's, a good, it's a good song. It's a good I know song. Sorry about that. Look at Joyce. Sorry, Queen yeah. Joyce. Sorry, Joyce. Thank you. I am, me and Joe unleashed a whole other song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, what, it, what, what people don't know is Ken and I, we talk all the time. Uh, every single week here, yeah, we're talking with like Joyce. <laughs> Oh, we talk about too, Rob man, Rob things. Holmes. Rob Holmes, he's a he's a double threat. He does soprano and tenor sax, bro. That's right. He's and been on he's many also of my play banjo. Yes, I I, <laughs> I, 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 I have this is called this is called a bantar. Because right. it's a six it's a six string banjo tuned exactly like a guitar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember Shakey's Pizza? Am I dating story myself? About again? A man named Jed. No, I'm yeah. playing that. Oh, that was cool. That was cool. Yeah. So anyway, with with Do walking more. each other home, that was the first song I wrote. Yeah. So that song came after about two or three days of writing things that I just wasn't happy with. Right. And that started to form. And um, and I knew I finally had started to get some fire, and uh, and then then I wrote I rewrote that melody a lot, like the hook, the chorus, because I just kept trying different ways, and I wanted every note to be there for a reason. And some of the melodies I was coming up with, they were good, but they sounded a little guitar-y, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And then I put the guitar down, and I only wrote melodies by singing. Maybe you do that too sometimes, Joyce, mm -hmm. uh, where you don't let the instrument play you. And as a singer, as a, you know, that helped because, and then I said, oh, if I can sing this, every note is supposed to be there. And then I made sure that it transferred to the guitar. And that's, that's, you know, that was where the writing part of that was, you know, a little tricky because it was so early in the process. And that's always my, you know, challenge when I get going. Yeah. All right. All right. Nice. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into that and, uh, and then we'll come back and, and, uh, wrap things up. So, uh, everybody get your ears ready because this is some great music. You're going to enjoy it. It is. Fantastic definitely, track. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks. And we'll. Uh, be right back right here on the Indie Live Spot.
music is, is uh, like we said, that was our guest here, uh, Ken Navarro. And uh, yeah, really enjoyed that, Ken. Both hey, thanks. Yeah. yeah, When We Beautiful. Dance is, uh, you know, I did not have a title for that at first, and then it just kind of became obvious, <clears throat> as it sometimes does. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What was your inspiration on that track, Ken? Well, initially, I, to be honest, it wasn't like I was thinking of any particular event or even a particular person. Um, I was trying to create a very romantic, uh, but in deep in the pocket groove, right. which is sometimes a challenge because you know it's easy to create a deep in the pocket groove that's driving. Mm -hmm. It's harder to create one that's throbbing, you know, more than driving. And so right. that was what I was going for. I knew I was going for something that you know, had a romantic, sexy quality to it, but yeah. I also wanted it to be kind of dreamy. Like, yeah. you know, so that was what was the inspiration behind it as opposed to a specific person or an event. Right. As, as it kind of came together, you know, it became more about that <clears throat> special bond I have with my wife, Kristen, and, right. you know, and I'm not a big dancer. People always think <laughs> because I'm a musician, I must dance, and I'm very shy when it comes to that. But right. with, her, I'm, with her, I'm not. Well, you and, know what we do now is we take and step back and see how many wedding receptions are going to play that song. <laughs> right, right. That would be nice. I Any uh, live tours coming up to promote the new album? Well, I'm trying to set some things up. It's I haven't done anything like that in years. Mm -hmm. um, I started by taking this Mallorca festival. They'd been asking me yeah. for years, and I kept turning them down. And I finally said, okay, no, I'm going to do this one. And now offers are coming in every week. And so I'm just trying to find the right ones, you know, that, that I can present this album correctly. Right. Um, and uh, it's not really about making money. It's more about having enough of a budget that I can do it right. <clears throat> Otherwise, I just end up playing the simplest of my songs. And that, you know, I just don't want to do that. I want to present what I've worked so hard to evolve to at this point after 25 albums. I want to make sure I can I can do the music justice in a live performance. Uh, and not pare it down. Yeah. Not yeah. if I can help it. I, I want to ask you real quick. Oh, just go back, going back on um, when the your vocals came up. As right. far as doing that, and that you've done, like maybe, or, you know, how you how you were working through that. Uh, when something that you mentioned about maybe just doing like sounds or like being part of like the, your guitar, making right. those sounds, and one the first thing that popped into my head was Steve Oliver. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he does that. That's what and he it does. Just, exactly. It was just like they're doing a duet, basically him and his right. guitar. Right. And that's exactly what George I thought of. George Benson did that. Exactly him too. Did it really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, they both do it really well. Uh, Absolutely. And, and um, yeah, that's another approach. You know, I, I think what I hear is the idea of two melodies, two mm -hmm. melodic instruments, <clears throat> one of them being the guitar, one of them being the voice, and trying to find a way to inter... It's a great challenge. I and, oh, and yeah. I brought it up. I really, it just hasn't been in my head because the previous vocal songs that I recorded were what I guess you'd call traditional songs. I wrote one of the songs was called Children Need a World that uh, I recorded instrumentally and vocally uh, on two different albums of mine. In fact, Tony Craddock did it on his album that I produced for him, uh, which is called H2O. Um, he did an instrumental version of it. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I, anyway, but no, I, it's really given me some, some food for thought as to a, a musical challenge for myself, uh, how to, to bring that up to, up to speed at the same level that the other things I'm, I, I think, same level as the other things I'm doing. Mm -hmm. right. right. No, right. you know. I hope you do. I hope you do. Thanks, Rizal. Yes, I appreciate that encouragement. What is your favorite? Festivals, if you go out and do it, or do you want <clears throat> more intimate, small Venues. I, I like preference? those 400, 500, 600 seat theaters when, when I'm at a place that I can draw that well. Uh, or I'm fine with a 100 person, 200 person club. The festivals are good. You get to play in front of a lot of people. And as I told you, that Penn's Landing experience was my, you know, best Your ultimate live experience. So, but the thing about a lot of the festivals is you don't even get a sound check. It's yeah. like you literally <laughs> come out and play. And it usually goes well because they're run well. I used to do those every year between the two towers at the World Trade Centers. Uh, CD 101 used to put on concerts every Wednesday at noon 
uh, and I, I did a number of those. Um, but yeah, so the festivals, uh, I, I certainly, if the right one, <clears throat> excuse me, came up, I would accept it. Mm -hmm. um, but they're a little trickier. And I, I tend to like the ones where we get there at one in the afternoon, we get comfortable, we get a great sound, we get to know the sound crew, right. we have dinner, then we come back and you're playing for people in a, a, a listening environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but you know, I, I don't mean to sound elitist about it, I'm not. Uh, but that is kind of what I prefer, you know, the feeling that you're really communicating with a, with somebody rather than throwing it out into the open air without a sound check. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you and know, then also maybe, um, sorry, my voice is going in and out. Me too. Uh, I know. But also on like those huge festivals, the crowd that, that's there might not have said, okay, well, who's this? So mm -hmm. you have to kind of prove yourself to them to win them right. over. Yeah, right. to work a little bit extra. Now, if you know that they paid to see you only, right? You don't, you know, you just you actually just like, okay, let's let's. Oh party. yeah, exactly. They're more at ease. They're going to give you that feedback. You're going to have. You're going to. Yes. You're going to feel that energy from them. Yeah, and, well, I've had I've had that other experience. It's not that they don't know who I am. They know who I am, but they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, I'm I'm in the middle of the afternoon. And they're right. waiting for Chaka Khan at seven. Exactly. I actually kind of enjoy that challenge mm -hmm. because okay. I, I feel like, okay, they're going to know some of what I play. Some of it they're never going to heard before because they didn't hear it on the local station. Right. Um, but I feel like anything over, you know, a, a, a good performance, any it's all icing on the cake, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I kind of pride myself on trying to show them what I can bring to the party. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, that's okay too. I mean, that's sort of the price you pay for an audience that's bigger than what you would draw, is you get exactly. to play right. for all those people, um, and uh, but you've got to show them that you deserve to be there too. Exactly. Right. Yeah. exactly. Now, did you say you're going to be playing at the uh, Mallorca? Yeah, yeah. They, I'm, I'm doing okay. that. Um, I'll play uh, my own uh, show there, and then I'll be part of uh, a couple different uh, jazz jam right. sessions. Sure, and yeah. I haven't even talked to him about it, but I know Eric Marienthal's doing it. Oh, and wow. I'm going to see if maybe um, there's a song of mine he would like to play on in my show, and I maybe there's a song of his he would like me to play on in his show. Right, cross so collaborate. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. We're all there for three or four days. Yeah, so. uh, matter of fact, Keiko Matsui, I think she's, she's going to be there too. Yeah, yeah, she's got about uh, three or four, and then uh, Mindy A. Bear is going to be there. Uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Pro Tour Hotels? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, Sandy Shore, she's going to be oh, there. Sandy will be there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know oh. Sandy all these years. In fact, I even interviewed her for my podcast. Right. Yeah. Because Sandy, you know, she's been around at doing this for yeah, so she's long. Been doing it a long oh, time. Yeah. Uh, she just I had a birthday. I've never been in the same room with her. I've yeah. never had her. That'll be so nice. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things that's going to be fun about that. Just being with all these people that, you know, right. feel right. like family, but I don't really know them. The right, way, you know, right. I'm with right. Some, same place. But now let me ask you this. I want to ask you this because there's going to be a lot of hard acts to follow. Mm -hmm. And plus that uh, with this, uh, festival, it's mm -hmm. a large festival, and then right. right after that, we got uh, Jazz Track Festival is going to be coming up in Catalina, Catalina, Catalina. Right. And I've talked to some artists, and they're <laughs> backstage, so they get one artist that comes out like Pieces of a Dream comes out. Right. Then you have Vincent and Gala; he's got to come right. back after that. Do you ever get the feeling? Holy crap! That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm the kind I, I am the kind of person who definitely, you know, but I and by the way, what I'm about yeah. to say, almost every <laughs> artist will tell you this when they're being honest. Right. You always tend to feel like, oh God, they're going to finally realize I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Because because I have so much respect for all these the people like some of the people you just mentioned. Right. Uh, not just as performers, but as musicians. Mm -hmm. But I know that what I do is is true to what I do, right, and right, that right. I, only I can do and make that play do that particular presentation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there may be there may be times where um, I'm pushing the audience a little farther than they right, right, go. Right, 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 um, right. 
but um, but I don't know. I, I guess I believe I believe in the integrity of what I'm doing, so right. that gets me through. But yeah. I'd be lying if I didn't say that I've been. <laughs> this, you know, I've heard people. Usually, yeah. it's, usually it's, they come after me, and I'm like really glad they came after me. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you walk out on stage, I'm in the <laughs> you know, right. but you know, you got to take and give yourself some credit. You have been around for a long, long time. You're well respected in the business. You started out as a sessions musician. Mm -hmm. Now look at you, look at where you're at. Yeah. So, you know, I got to kind of look at it like this with some of these other artists. They need to view you. Okay. I'm in, I'm in the midst of greatness now. Well, I've been, well, no, seriously, you know, there's no, nothing wrong with reaching back then giving yourself a pat on the back, but, you know, for your music, and I've been a long time Ken Navarro fan, you know, and there's nothing of your music I don't like, but the fact is, you're well respected, you've been in the business, and you're here for a long time, God bless you, as long as you stay, and we're always going to love your music. So, right. you know, that's what oh, I'm wow. saying, yeah, yeah, you know. Well, and I, I feel I am. I do feel that some from some of the younger players, which is nice because I'm my Vincent is a fabulous player and oh, not just of the saxophone, by the way, as you yeah. know, He's the multi no. instrumentalist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, and, good. <laughs> uh, yeah and so, you know, but it's nice when you sense that they that they <laughs> recognize what you've accomplished and that you've right. stayed in the game, you know, and it's gone through the changes, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. you wonder if 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, especially when we like, as you so well put it earlier, Joe, we're passing the torch on to yeah. these people. Right. So Vincent and Gallo are going. Yeah. You know, and, and I felt that mm -hmm. big time with Tony Craddock. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Because, uh, you know, I, uh, I <laughs> for one thing, he'd be going for 10 hours when we were recording all the sax parts at my studio. We'd be going for 10 hours and I'd be like, Okay, I think we're done for the day. And Tony's <laughs> like a young engine, you know. Oh, really, really? Yeah, we're, I know. <laughs> I, the same thing with Eric Darius. I produced Eric Darius's first uh, first album, and, um, and and Eric was just he stayed. He lived with us for a week or two okay. weeks, and um, during the day, he would be you know like one of the guys. You know, right. he, it didn't matter that he was 21 years old. He was right. like on his own totally. And then at night, he'd be going out you know, playing video games with my kids who are closer to his age, you know? And I, I, I realized, well, he can do, he can do this at 12, 14 hours. I, I need, after eight, I put in my work day. Yeah. Um, so you're done. <laughs> I'm done, you know, I can't really function at the high level I need to, you know? And, and you okay. know what? It's a thing that you mentioned, Eric Darius. If you've been to a live Eric Darius concert, oh, yeah. it's like yeah. osmosis, the yeah. energy that he, puts on the stage and then when he comes on to the audience right. and he's playing in the audience I mean it's like okay it's like you touch him and you can get the energy it's like he never runs out but right. let me ask you this have you ever had some of the young lions that we're talking about come up to you and say hey I remember when you did this album and this song on this day have you ever had that happen say that again you froze right in the middle of that question have you ever had some of these young lions when they meet you for the first time say Ken Ken Navarro, I remember when you did this album, this song, and then you're going, wow, I haven't even thought of this album. Have yeah, you ever that had that happen? happen? <laughs> that has, in fact, I even had a thing where I was at an airport, I won't mention their name, but you know, somebody we all know, and, um, um, and, and I, I didn't know it, but he said, hey, we we're waiting for our backs. He said, hey, that's there's your song from your second album. <laughs> I, I didn't even recognize it. I said, no, it's not. And I looked at him, oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, so um, but you know it's a nice thing i mean to to be a survivor in this in the music business right. and and to have to have influenced people who are you know much younger than me right. is really you know it's really an honor for me to, especially when they're of the caliber of an eric darius or a vincent or, or a tony craddock jr i mean you know these are people who uh i would be proud to be involved with on any level and you know when i'm the one producing them yeah. and and you know guiding them um that's 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 an honor yeah uh, for me too so it's 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 I'm, I'm pretty lucky that that has happened some yeah and you know what if you take a look at the movement mm -hmm. of the mantle 
okay? Guys like you, uh, Paul Brown, mm -hmm. other guitarists, they go back and they say, okay, my influences were uh, West Montgomery, Muddy Waters, this, and now take a look at the Young Lions, they're moving back. Right. They're saying, my That's influences cool. are kid in the bow. Paul Brown, yeah, you see I the guess, movement? I guess, wow, I never quite think of it that way because I'm, I guess I'm so busy trying to make sure I'm still making a living at this, you know. I, I don't <laughs> tend to, you know. But you're right. That that is part of what's going on. That's that's pretty, that's pretty nice too. And all the more reason why I, I take each new record even more seriously than the previous one. I guess I'm just aware that this is what I will leave someday. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I want it to be. It may not always be exactly what everybody wanted at the time, right. but I think if it's quality and it comes, again, I don't mean to sound like a cliche, but it's true. If it comes from the, the soul and the heart, I, I think that that is what lasts. Well, so, have you ever had anybody do any covers of any of your tracks? Well, you know, like I was saying, Tony Craddock did one on his yeah, There we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hear from people, uh, nothing uh, that big uh, uh, typically, but I hear from people that go, oh, go check out YouTube. I just, here's me playing this song of yours. <laughs> and that song, you know, like somebody saying, I, here's You Are Everything, that your song from Love Colored Soul. And somebody else did a cover of Juliet, which was from Unbreakable. Okay. Nobody did a cover of Ruby Lane yet? Not yet. <laughs> I've heard some smooth sensations too. But well, you know what? That was a personal that was a personal song. Yeah. That's my granddaughter. Julia. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember yeah. you sent me the uh EPK on that and yeah. we talked about that. That's yeah, yeah, she she yeah, shit's great because now she's she was like three months old. Yeah, we yeah, spoke, yeah. That song yeah. It's, well, I joked and said we're gonna be we're gonna start a college fund. I hope they don't hold me to it, but that's what I, I <laughs> well, think. This see that was 2014. So Ruby, she's what, uh, what six, seven? Jul Jul Juliet will be five this year. Juliet. Yeah, that's so right. Juliet actually came out in 2015, and um, yeah, she's she'll turn five this year. And now she is really good at saying, Alexa, play my song, <laughs> Juliet. You know, but nice. she said, Find my grandpa. Very <laughs> nice. <laughs> Find my grandpa. We'll see if I, they say those echoes are really listening to us. I, I, I know what you're talking about. Maybe they are listening a little too hard. I don't. I don't know. No, but, has has she uh, grasped yeah. the concept yet that that grandpa right. that he's that he's a famous musician? No, no. no but she, <laughs> the first thing when she was here last weekend, and she first thing she wants to do is come up to the studio, okay. and she just runs from guitar to guitar, basically hitting them. But okay. <laughs> I, I have a small, I have a mandolin, which is just her size. And so she sits herself down on the floor and, and you know, she has to have a pick. She's got to get a pick, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but, <Nice. laughs> but no, you know, someday, that, someday maybe. Now, is know. that a Fender Stratocaster I see in that's the background? It? That's right. That's what I used on Green Chili Stew. Okay. Uh, yeah, where's old where's the Les Paul? I want to see the. I know I, you. Gotta... I don't own one anymore. Uh, I, I had one for a while when I lived in L.A. Okay. I gotta tell you, I never really quite gelled with it. Uh, it was heavy, as you probably know. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. it had a a dark kind of sound to it that, when I pick up the strap, what I like about it is it's it's a very friendly, but it's a bright higher clean sort of a sound that right. even right. the distorted guitar it distorts in, like on green chili stew it distorts in a more musical way to me the les paul is wonderful and i used to use it on recording sessions in la oh, yeah. uh, okay because when they wanted like i was doing a jingle for ford or something and they wanted that you know <laughs> guns and roses sound that I was, <laughs> that's how you got that but it didn't quite feel like it was me, you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, I ended up selling it to a student, I think, back right. before I even left LA. That's awesome. Now, is it, is it just me, but a lot of you, uh, a lot of you guitarists, uh, it's a Les Paul in the studio, Stratocaster when you're live, or do, uh, that's what I know. Well, I, I tended, by the time I moved to LA, I didn't own a Strat. I never owned a Strat before I moved to LA. I got there and I realized right away, oh, everybody's got a Strat, you know? Right, right. So they had moved on to that sound in the studio. And that's the Strat that I bought, by the way, back in 1982 when I first moved there. Right. And uh, my, I had a great experience with it. One of my first calls was to do a, uh, a TV session for, what was it, Barnaby Jones? I can't remember yeah. the stuff. And it was like an orchestra. 
and there was this Jeb Clampett. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. There, there was there was this guitar part that um, I could have played it when I was 15. It wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. But I put the Strat on that out of phase setting that's so pretty, and and yeah. and yeah. and I played these chords with this really pretty voicing, and the conductor stops the orchestra and he turns to me, which is every studio <laughs> musician's nightmare, really. He turns to me and he says, "What are you doing?" And I was like, I, "I'm playing what's here on the page." He said, "Whatever you're doing, it's beautiful." There you know, you and I thought. I have nothing to do with it. It's this new guitar I just bought that he's just <laughs> loved the way it sounds. So I knew I had a good one. Well, um, so, yeah. Oh, okay. I, well, I hate to I hate to break into this, but it's about time for us oh, to yeah. wrap things yeah. up. Like so, uh, before, before we do though, uh, Ken, again, I'd like to thank you very much for hanging out with us today and sharing. Uh, all the great things about you and the music and all that good stuff and if you could before uh, we do wrap things up could you uh, share with our, our listeners and watchers um, where they can follow you and, and places where they can go to uh, I'm happy, yeah I'm happy to do that and yes. you know you guys I mean I this has been a privilege and a pleasure for me too and I just want to say that before we sign off I hope we get to do it again sometime oh, yeah. that'll be fun uh, but yeah they can they can I hope so. Thanks, Griselda. Um, yeah, they can, you know, I've got both a musician page and a personal page on Facebook. The personal page is, you know, the 5,000 friend limit, but they can always go to my musician page, which is where I uh, put everything really that's on the personal page. I don't put the pictures of Juliet on the on the musician page, <laughs> and I, I avoid talking about Trump on the musician page. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, you know, so that I'm there. I'm on Instagram, and I'm very active on all three of those formats. I'm not very active on Twitter. I have an account, uh, you know, but I, I, I find myself more with the interaction of, that I feel so comfortable with Facebook and Instagram. My website is www.kennavarro.com, and it's a very easy website where you can uh, watch all kinds of videos, listen to samples of the new album, all my albums. Yes. It's, it's, I, I designed it myself to make it so that it's the kind of experience, whether you're on the phone or on a laptop, that makes you feel like it's clean and easy to find things. I'm yeah. constantly adding new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I added like a, a eight paragraph thing about how I created the new album, okay, uh, which is there and you can get in-depth stuff. I noticed some people's website, they're kind of like, th you know, you don't get much detail. You right, get, right, right. I've got that set up so that it's nice and easy. You can get where you want to go quick. But then right. if you want to really get into it, I, I do that too. And I take the time to, to write things like that and to try to express something that right. people maybe who don't have the record don't want to read it yet, but right. people who have it go, oh, this is amazing. I really see right. how you did this. I have a YouTube channel, um, mm -hmm. and uh, which I keep, you know, as I mentioned, I've got five more videos on the right. back burner ready to roll out. Okay. So I always ask people to follow me on YouTube because then they get a notification when the yeah. And you know, I, I I'm still selling CDs and downloads, and okay. it's going okay. But I'm very yeah. active also on Spotify and Pandora right. and Apple Music. So you know, now I'm when is the new CD? Song. When is the new CD set to drop, Ken? It actually released on Friday. Yes, it released on Friday. And it was I don't know where it is now, but it was number four at Amazon and number twelve at iTunes, and and it was doing really well. Right. Well, congratulations, Honestly, man! Now for broadcasters. Did you send us hard copy? And I know you and I, like I said, you and I, we talk all the time right, on email. Right. Or did you do MP3? How are you doing I that? Just, I've just sent the single so far. Now that the album's dropped, now I will send out whatever people want. The hard copy. Uh, yeah, well, I'll either, a lot of people don't want it. They just, it gets lost. No, 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 no. I want it. And you oh, better, no, no, I need And, and you better autograph it. <laughs> oh, of course. But, and, and, and folks like us, it doesn't no, sound please, not wait a minute, please autograph it. Oh, yeah. I, I'm happy to do that. I'm, appreci I'm glad you told me, though. That's good. But yeah. I, I will send some hard copies to people who, that's what they want. And then there are other people... You know, I just they just get a download of the album. That's I, I send it with like all the graphics. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, clip. yeah. But the CD is the only way it sounds like it sounds like in my studio. Mm -hmm. We you know? appreciate. It. I'm we always appreciate amazed it. how good it sounds. Yeah, uh, I'm always amazed how good it sounds coming out of the out of an i an iPad or out of out of my my Echo. But I'm amazed by it because it shouldn't sound that. Good. But then I hear it 
through a stereo system with a CD, and I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, well, that's right, that's how it's supposed to sound. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Waiting, waiting to exhale. <laughs> <laughs> there is a difference, definitely. <laughs> how many times have I aged myself today? I don't know. <laughs> We riding, oh, well. we riding with you, man. I can't. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thanks well. again for having me. You've been wonderful hosts, and um, uh, you know, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll look Thank forward you. to our next chance. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and uh, and of course, uh, for those if, uh, if you happen to tune in late, uh, there will be archive of this uh, where you'll be able right. to catch this. So we'll we'll definitely post all that stuff for you. And uh, again, we thank uh, Ken for hanging out. And um, Grizz, uh, do we have anything stored for next week as far as guest wise? Oh, yeah, we do. Mostly we do. for Joe to say okay. To, okay. for Joe to say okay. his goodbyes. All right. Well, Joe, take us, uh, yep. take us out. Uh, with, join me every single Sunday from 4 to 7 p.m. for group jazz music. Top 10 smooth jazz countdown. Mm -hmm. Check my Facebook okay. page. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. a listener. <laughs> and then starting uh, the 26th of February, I will also be with uh, Global Sensations Radio Network, uh, broadcasting with them from 4 to 7 on Wednesdays, hump day with the taste of smooth jazz Sweet. excellent all right grizz all right ken again thank you for spending the time that you were able to come on with us thank you my pleasure yeah. thanks again for asking me and i'll i'll, I'll talk to you soon joe but i'll see see you the next time oh yeah we know hey uh, and okay. a shout out to gary <laughs> yes <laughs> big shout out to gary, gary. Yeah, I know. Incredible. Thanks. And Grizz, behind the scenes, and we how this appreciate you, and we love you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Guys, make this make, you make this really easy for the guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys. You. See you next time. All, All right, right, Ken. Okay. All right. Bye. Take care. See you later, Ken. Everybody, tune in next week. We have our, our next guest will be, <clears throat> again, I apologize for my voice, but it's the, he's called the Jazz Boy. His name is Dino Fiumara. And he is a singer, keyboardist. He's amazing. So join us next week. He will be our guest. And have a great weekend. Be careful out there. And we'll see you later. Ciao. Peace and coolness, everybody. Take care of each other. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Ciao. Bye-bye.